Hi, welcome to Creation Care Church Friday Night Live message. This week's topic is why in Acts 10, did God tell Peter, arise Peter, kill and eat? So that's the question for today. And while we give people a few minutes to show up, let's go over a few announcements. First one is thank you for sharing this broadcast. Uh, if you have invited anybody, be sure to let them know that we're starting and so that they could join in if you're watching this live. If you're not watching this live, we welcome you. You can watch it live on our Facebook page or afterwards if you don't make it to the live, you could tune in later. Uh, you could also watch it on YouTube and we're trying to get it also put up as a podcast, which we'll talk about that a little bit more later. And the format of today's talk is like usual, where we have the uh, the talk portion followed by the Q&A. So if you have your own Bible, I encourage you to get it out and follow along. We're going to be spending a lot of time in Acts 10, so be sure to open up the Bible to that page and bookmark it because half the verses we're going to use today are Acts 10. So again, the, the talk today, the topic is why in Acts 10 did God tell Peter, arise Peter, kill and eat? So before we get started and before we pray, I have an unfortunate announcement to make, and this is that Timothy J. Verrett, he's a member of CCC, he's the coordinator for the newsletter, he wrote the God Sonnets, um, very valued member of Creation Care Church. Uh, it's unfortunate to uh, announce that he passed away this week. So unfortunately, he won't be joining us anymore. But we wanted to take a, a few minutes to talk about what Timothy meant to CCC. So for me, one of the things that really stands out about him is his encouragement. So he was always very encouraging, would always say, you know, great job, you know, whatever, whether it was a written piece, a video, live talk. He's always like, wow, great job, great job, very encouraging, always encouraging. And he was always zealous to, to volunteer for things. So anytime something needed to be done, he would be the first to step up and say, I can do that, I'll do it. So without that, it's going to be a very difficult transition, but uh, this is God is leading us and uh, God will, will continue to provide everything that CCC needs but right now we're still kind of processing and grieving over this uh, important loss. And it was kind of all of a sudden, no one expected it. Uh, and one thing that kind of gives us hope is that we all do have the hope that whenever our time does come and our life is over on earth, we all have the hope in Christ of being resurrected to eternal life in God's kingdom. And I know Timothy definitely had that hope. And everyone who knew him would say, you know, this is a man of God. This is someone who's preaching to me the gospel message. This is someone who has a heart for all of God's creatures, human and non-human, as he would say. And so we just look forward to that day where we can be reunited with Timothy in the kingdom. And we hope that uh, as many people could join us as well. So we just wanted to kind of let everyone know this sad news um, but there is hope. There is hope that we all have to be united with Jesus in God's kingdom. So again, the talk today, why in Acts 10 did God tell Peter, arise Peter, kill and eat? And as Timothy would always say, as, a, as a, an actor, he would say, the show must go on. So the show must go on. Let's, let's open up with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity where we can come together for another Friday Night Live message. We just ask that anyone who needs to hear this message tonight would, would hear it, and that anybody who uh, needs a, a comforting word or uh, encouragement, that we would able, be able to provide that tonight, and that anyone who maybe has a question about Acts 10, that that would be clarified tonight and that we would all gain a deeper understanding of this chapter and what the significance of it was and what the purpose of this vision that was given to Peter. So we pray all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. 
So let's start in Acts 10. So open your Bible to Acts 10. And let's start reading some of the story where it begins. It begins in verse 9. So let's start with verse 9 and let's uh, read several verses. So it says, Acts 10, verse 9. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. So the context of the story is Peter's hungry, and he goes up to the rooftop to pray, and then he's hungry up there, and then he sees this vision. This He goes into this dream or this trance, and then that's uh, what we're about to talk about next is what that vision was about. So in uh, verse 11, he fell into the trance and saw heaven or the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. And in it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. So he's in this trance, he's in this uh, this dreamlike state, and he gets this vision, and it's this sheet of animals that are des that's descending down out of the sky. And we'll later find out that these animals on the sheet are the animals that, according to Jewish law, were considered unclean. So these were unclean animals, which meant there were animals that were off limits to be eaten under any circumstance. So let's continue in verse 13. So this sheet of animals, these unclean animals, is descending from the sky. And then a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven or the sky again. So this sheet of animals that are considered unclean, so they're animals that you cannot eat if you're following God's dietary instructions that he gave through the Mosaic Law. And so now this voice, which is understood as the voice of God, is saying, Peter, kill these animals and eat them. And Peter's like, what? No, certainly not, because God's dietary laws prohibit the eating of these unclean animals. And so I'm not going to break God's commandment to, to eat these unclean animals. And so this, this happens three times, and then the sheet goes up uh, to, back into the sky and then this is what, what Peter thinks about after that whole situation takes place. In verse 17, it says, Now while Peter wondered or puzzled within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. So this, this vision was, was given to Peter, and it was perplexing to him. He's like, what just happened? Why did God tell me to kill and eat these animals that God had already said I should not kill and eat, that they were forbidden to, to kill and eat these animals? And he's like, what, what God calls clean, you shall not call unclean, but these are unclean animals. And like, I don't understand. What's the purpose of this vision? And he's perplexed by it, and he's puzzling over it, and he's grappling with it. He's trying to understand what was the significance of this vision. So it's an important, there's quite a few important things going on here, and we'll continue to read in Acts 10, but there's a few things I wanted to talk about first. So one thing to keep in mind in verses 15 and 16, uh, he did not kill and eat these animals. So that's one thing to keep in mind. He did not kill and eat the animals, even though the voice told him to do it. And in fact, it told him three times, and all three times he refused to do it. So as we'll kind of continue to unpack what this meant, that'll come back and that'll be significant. And another significant thing is that he puzzled over the meaning of the vision. It wasn't immediately clear to him why that vision happened and what it was trying to tell him. So before we get into him understanding the vision, I want to kind of lay out a few other things. Uh, the first is that the purpose of the vision, he says in verse 28, so let's turn to 28. So Acts 10, 28, it says, 
Then he, Peter, said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So here basically what happens is he has this vision and then he's like, what did, what did that vision mean? And then these uh, members of the house of Cornelius, who's a Gentile, so it's a Gentile household, uh, they come to him and say, hey, come with us. And he goes with them. And then uh, he has this conversation with Cornelius. And he's like, you know that it's forbidden, according to Jewish law, for a Jew to go into a house of a Gentile. But... God has revealed to me that you shall not call anything clean, unclean that God has deemed clean. And so Peter is saying that God revealed this to him. Well, how did he reveal that to him? He revealed it to him through that vision, right? Where Peter's saying, no, I'm not going to eat these unclean animals because God said they were unclean. And so I'm going to follow God's instruction of abstaining from eating them. And so now he's like, ah, I get it. I understand what the vision meant. It wasn't about animals and eating unclean animals. It was about not calling Gentiles unclean. And so that was this aha moment and the significance where Peter understands the vision. And he says in verse 28 that we just read that God revealed this knowledge to him, that uh, he could keep the company of the Gentiles. So now let's fast forward a little further. Let's look at verses 34, 35, and 36. There it says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. So this is pretty clear here that Peter was understanding the vision, that the purpose of the vision wasn't that unclean animals are added to the menu, that God wanted Peter to start killing and eating these unclean animals, but he understood that the purpose of the vision, after he pondered over it sufficiently, was that it was about people and salvation, that Jesus didn't just die for the Jews, he died uh, for all people. And so salvation is open to everyone, not just to Jewish people, because it had previously been thought that it was only for Jewish people. So that was a very significant revelation, and that was the kind of important point that, that's made here and the, the significance of this vision and Peter grappling with it and understanding the vision. So why are we talking about this, this subject? Well, one is that it's a very misunderstood uh, story, and it's pretty clear in the text, like we just read, what the significance of the vision was. It was about salvation for people. It wasn't about God saying, now I, I want you to start killing and eating these unclean animals that I previously told you not to kill and eat. Uh, but then some people, they'll kind of use this passage. They'll say, no, 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 now I can eat pig flesh because... God told Peter he wants him to start killing and eating pigs. And so they'll kind of use this story as justification for harming animals. So that's kind of one of the reasons why Creation Care Church is addressing this topic. So the purpose of the vision was that salvation is not only for Jews, but also for Gentiles. And as we read in verse 28, uh, Peter understood that significance. So now the next question would be, and I think it's not a very contentious point, that the vision, at least in part, had to do with salvation salvation being open to the Gentiles. And if somebody still wants to use it as a reason to like not care about pigs and to kill them and eat their flesh and thinks God's okay with that, well, they're basically saying there's two purposes to the vision. That one purpose is that salvation is open, not just for the Jews, but to all people. But then there's this other purpose of the vision, where now God is saying all animals are on the menu, that you can now kill and eat any animal, whether it's clean or unclean, and there's no restrictions anymore. And 
that is not a view with a scriptural basis. So let's think about this for a second, and let's look up some important passages. So if we look at, starting with Leviticus 11.11, 11, and this is one of several verses that make this point clear. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 11, it says, and this is coming after a, a list of animals, they shall be an abomination to you, you shall not eat their flesh, but you shall regard their carcasses as unclean or as an abomination. So he's talking about this list of unclean animals saying, don't under any circumstance eat any of these animals. And so they're unclean. And so that was kind of part of the significance of this vision. And why it makes sense is because Peter's saying, wait, no, God, you told me I should not under any circumstance eat these unclean animals. Now there's this sheet of unclean animals, and you're telling me to kill them and eat them. And so that's why it was perplexing to Peter that God would contradict himself in that way. But what later became clear to him once he puzzled over it enough, it was not actually that God wanted him to start killing and eating unclean animals. It was about salvation being open to everyone. And so this point of salvation being open to everyone is something that Paul reiterates. And so, again, if we're, if we're looking for scriptural basis for whether it was just a vision about salvation being open to everyone or whether it was also a vision about unclean animals now being on the menu. Okay, so I'm first going to look at the scriptural basis for why uh, salvation being open to the Gentiles is what the vision was about. So let's look at Romans 3.28. Romans chapter 3. Or not 28, 29. So Romans 3, 29. There it says, uh, let's see. Or is he the God, God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. So here Paul is reiterated, reiterating this point that Peter made as the understanding, the correct understanding of the vision. He's saying, is God just the God of the Jews? No, he's also God of the Gentiles. He's God of everyone. Everyone has this opportunity to, for salvation and for coming to this, this God, to God, the, the creator of the universe. And so what scriptural basis do we have that Peter correctly understood the vision? Well, after this point, when Paul is speaking in his letter to the Romans, he's saying the same point, that salvation is open also to the Gentiles. So that's an indication that that was one of the purposes, but there is no similar uh, scriptural support for the disciples starting to kill and eat unclean animals or teaching that it's acceptable to eat unclean animals. So we don't have that same uh, evidence that we have with the uh, someone who says, no, 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 it's both. So there's no evidence either in Acts 10 or anywhere else in Scripture of Peter or any other disciple of Jesus eating the flesh of unclean animals or teaching that it is acceptable to do so. So that's why it wouldn't be both. And another interesting kind of side note, if you were watching our live talk a few weeks ago about uh, the question was, did Jesus declare all foods clean? Uh, because he was talking about, uh, let's see, the Pharisees were accusing his disciples of eating with unwashed hands. And he says, what goes into your mouth doesn't defile you. It's what comes out of your mouth that defiles you. And so people interpret that as Jesus declaring all foods clean, saying now pigs and shellfish and all the unclean animals are on the menu. And, well, this vision which came after Jesus, because this was after Jesus' death and resurrection, well, why would Peter be saying, no, Lord, I'm not going to eat these unclean animals if Jesus had already declared all foods clean, right? So that wouldn't make sense. So this is just further evidence proof that Jesus did not declare all foods clean. Otherwise, Peter would be like, oh, yeah, I know Jesus already declared pigs clean or these sheet of unclean animals clean, so I can eat them no problem. And it wouldn't have been perplexing to him. It wouldn't have been significant. And so uh, the fact that it was perplexing to him and he was saying, no, 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 uh, I'm not going to eat anything unclean, 
that indicates that Jesus did, in fact, not declare all foods clean, as some believe he did. In fact, Jesus was just saying, it's not a sin to eat with unwashed hands. That's all he was saying. So that's kind of a side note that I wanted to point out. So then the next question that you might be thinking is, if really the whole point of that vision was just that salvation is open to everyone and that it had nothing to do with unclean animals being added to the menu, well then why didn't God just say, hey, Peter, salvation is for the Gentiles also, not just the Jews. Now go to the house of Cornelius and share this message and preach them the gospel and they'll receive the Holy Spirit. Why didn't God just do that? Why did he give Peter this perplexing vision to where he had to grapple with it and figure it out for himself? Good question. So uh, in order to understand God, what I call God's pedagogical style, so pedagogy is your teaching method, how you uh, convey knowledge or teach things. And throughout scripture, God has this way of teaching where it, it's called testing. That's usually the, the way that it's translated where God tests us to reveal what is in our heart. So let's look at that. Let's look at uh, Deuteronomy 8.2. So Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. It says, And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what is in your heart whether you would keep his commandments or not. So this way of testing us is to reveal what's in our heart. And he does this throughout scripture. So for instance, let's look at Genesis 22, verse 1. So the very first book of the Bible, Genesis 22, verse 1. There it says, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. And said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And then verse 2, And God said, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So here God is testing Abraham to reveal what's in his heart, and he's testing him by asking him, hey, your son, this son that I had promised you, if you want the backstory, he's basically thought he was never going to have children, no heir. And then God's like, no, you're, you and your 100-year-old wife, Sarah, you're going to have this son, Isaac, and then you're going to have this great multitude of grandchildren through Isaac. And so he was the son of the promise that God gave him. Now God's saying, all right, even though I've promised you that through Isaac, now I want you to kill your son, Isaac, before he ever has any children. Okay, so he's testing Abraham to see what he'll do when he gives this instruction. So the test was to see how much faith was in Abraham's heart and to cause him to grapple with what God would have to do in order to keep his promise about Isaac. So let's look at Hebrews eleven seventeen through 19. So all the way to the New Testament, the book of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 17 through 19. I'll read from the NIV here. So Hebrews eleven seventeen to 19 says, By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. So this is important because it, it shows what Abraham's thought process was. So first God says, through Isaac, you're going to have many children. So this promise comes through Isaac. And now God's saying, okay, I want you to sacrifice your son. So then Abraham's like, how could this be? How could I sacrifice my son and he's still the, the, the child through which I have all these descendants? How is that even possible? And so it says here in this verse we just read that Abraham reasoned that God's 
promises are are so unbreakable, so reliable, so trustworthy that even if Abraham sacrifices his son Isaac, kills him, God will raise him back from the dead just so that he could have those children and so that God's promise comes true. And so that's how much faith that Abraham had in God's promises that he was willing to sacrifice his son, believing that God would resurrect him in order to keep God's promise about the descendants coming through Isaac. Okay, So that was the test. He was testing him to see what, what faith he had, and he was causing Abraham to grapple with this instruction. where He's like, what? Like, I, you, you just told me, God, that through Isaac, I'm going to have all these children, and now you're telling me to sacrifice him? How is that possible? And so he grapples with it, just like Peter was grappling with it. He's like, but wait, God, you said I should never eat any unclean animals under any circumstance. Now you're telling me kill and eat these unclean animals. What does that mean? How do I understand this? How does this make sense? And so this is God's, uh, God's pedagogical style. It's the way he tests us is to revealing, it reveals our faith and causes us to grapple with his instructions until we understand the significance of it. So as Peter did, he, under, he understood the purpose of the vision, that it was salvation is open to the Gentiles, and that's why when he acts on that, the whole house of Cornelius receives the Holy Spirit, which we'll look at in just a minute. But similarly, Abraham, when he went to sacrifice his son Isaac, so let's turn back to Genesis 22. Genesis 22, and let's look at verse 2, which we just read. Um, he says, go and sacrifice your son. And then verse 8, and Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. And the two of them went together. So Isaac's like, wait, dad, um, we have all the sticks. We have all the wood. Like we're going to start this fire. We're sacrificing an animal, but where's the lamb? Where's the animal we're going to sacrifice? And so he's like, God will provide the lamb. And then in verse 12, and he said, and this is God saying, do not lay your hand on the lad, your child Isaac, or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. So basically he goes up and he like, puts down the wood and he's like, all right, Isaac, here it comes. I'm like, got his knife in his hand about to like kill him. And then God's like, no, 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 stop. This isn't actually what I wanted. It was a test. So don't actually kill your son. He's going to be the son that you have all the children from just like I promised. So don't kill him. And so he doesn't, he stops. And so that significance there was that God will provide that lamb so God said to Abraham, hey, sacrifice your son, your son of the promise. And Abraham was like, well, I'll do it because I trust you and I, tr I have faith in your promises that you'll resurrect him. And so he stops him. But then instead, God provides the lamb. God provides his own son, Jesus. And that's what he did on the cross. So let's look at John 129. So the Gospel of John... Chapter 1, verse 29. And there it says, The next day John, this is John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. So there's Jesus as the Lamb. That's the Lamb, the only begotten Son of God, the Son of the promise. And God says to Abraham, Sacrifice your son Isaac. And then he's like, Stop, don't actually do that. It was a test. I'm going to sacrifice my own son, Jesus, instead. I will provide the, the lamb. And so that was the significance of that story and how uh, it was a similar kind of test where he caused Abraham to grapple with these contradictory instructions that he's like, wait, what? I'm supposed to do what? How does that make sense? And so Peter understood the vision, and Abraham at least partially understood the vision, not fully because he still sacrificed a ram that was stuck in, a th in the thicket, not realizing that it was Jesus, the Son of God, that was the lamb that God was providing. 
but he at least understood it enough to where he was obedient and carried out, uh, at least to the point that proved that he had the faith. All right, so the next thing, uh, although Peter's vision was not explicitly referred to as a test, it kind of shows all the signs of being a test. So, for instance, God gave an instruction that's contrary to his stated desire. And so as we looked at in Leviticus, and it also says in Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy 14.3, it says, you must not eat any detestable thing that is ceremonially unclean. So again, this idea of these unclean animals on the sheet, God says not to eat them, and now he's saying kill and eat them, and that's perplexing. And so since he pondered over the meaning of the vision, uh, similar to the way Abraham reasoned, uh, as it says in Hebrews, so if we look back at Acts 10, 17, we already read this verse. So Acts 10, 17, where it says, He has sent this message to the people of Israel, proclaiming the gospel of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Wait, that's Acts 10, 36. 17 is, while Peter was puzzling over the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house and approached the gate. So he was puzzling over the meaning of the vision. So he had to really grapple with it like Abraham did. It wasn't immediately clear what it was supposed to mean because at face value, it was a contradictory instruction. And he's like, wait, that can't be true because like that's that, that wouldn't make sense with what you already said. But then once he grapples with it enough, he realizes that's not actually what it's about. He had to come to the actual understanding of it on his own. So now let's look at Acts 10, 34 and 35. So Acts 10, 34 and 35 says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. So this is basically Peter saying that everybody has the opportunity to be saved. It's not just people who are Jewish. It is everyone can come to know God and be saved. So that's an important realization that comes from this vision. And if we look at verses 44 through 46, this is the culmination of it. He says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, uh, Can anyone forbid water? Let them be baptized. Uh, let's see. Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord uh, Jesus. Then they asked him to stay a few days. So basically, they, this house of Gentiles uh, all receives this word of God, receives this, this message that he preaches of Jesus as the Messiah and salvation being open to everyone. And they all receive the Holy Spirit, just as the disciples did at Pentecost in the upper room. And they start speaking in tongues, just like the apostles did. And so the circumcised believers who came with Peter were, saw this and they're like, whoa, that's exactly what happened to us at Pentecost. So that's clearly evidence of the Holy Spirit. And so then they're like, well, we, we better baptize them because it says unless you're fully submerged in water and come out of the water and you're a new creation in Christ, you've died to the flesh, you're a new creation, you're baptized in water. Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, you cannot enter the kingdom unless you be born again, uh, baptized of water. So they do that there. Okay, so now they're baptized in water, they're baptized with the Holy Spirit, they're speaking with tongues of fire, and so that's clear evidence that Peter understood the vision correctly. Because if God was like, nah, Peter, you got this wrong, I just want you to start eating pigs, then the Gentiles here would not have received the Holy Spirit the way they did. And so this is clear evidence that Peter understood the vision correctly, that it was about salvation is open to everyone, including Gentiles. And again, there's no, uh, there's no evidence anywhere in Scripture, either in Acts 10 or anywhere, of any of Jesus' disciples 
eating unclean animals or teaching that it's acceptable to eat unclean animals. So given that lack of evidence, it's not that God was doing both. It was, in fact, he was giving this perplexing vision to Peter so that Peter could grapple with it and understand it, and he did correctly understood it, understand it, that it was salvation was open not just to Jews but to everyone, including the Gentiles. All right, so that's the live portion of the talk. Uh, if you have any questions, hopefully you've been asking them in the chat, and we'll get to those in just a minute. All right, so first, uh, Angel. Hey, Craig. Hi, Angel. Thank you for joining us. Kelsey, hello, everyone. Good to be here. Glad to have you here, too, as well. And Roz, uh, welcome, everyone. Glad you are here. So Kelsey and Roslyn, those are the two newest members of CCC leadership team. Uh, Kelsey is in charge of our Instagram account. If you haven't checked out our Instagram, Creation Care Church, be sure to check that out. And Roz is in charge of our social media promotion. So thank you for all the work that both of you do. And let's see, Trey. Hello, beautiful souls. Hello, Trey. Thanks again for joining us. Kelsey, are animals included in the Gentiles? Because the scripture says salvation is open to everyone. Okay, so that's an interesting idea. And this is kind of a, a harder thing for, for people to uh, accept because people say, well, humans were created in God's image and the animals weren't, and that uh, basically that's the reason why we can be saved and animals can't. Uh, but there's an interesting prophecy in Joel 2.28 that I'd like to share with you. So Joel 2.28 and this is, was partially fulfilled at Pentecost, what I was referring to, where the, the disciples all received the Holy Spirit, where Jesus said, all right, I died, I was resurrected, and that all happened at uh, Passover and just after Passover. And now he says, wait around, tarry in the city. Don't start this ministry just yet, because power hasn't come, come down on you from on high. So just wait around until the appointed time. And so they, they waited around until Pentecost, which was the appointed time, which is the 50th day. That's what Pentecost means, 50. And so uh, several, like a month, a little over a month later, after the death and resurrection of Jesus, comes Pentecost, where they're all in this upper room, and that's where they receive the Holy Spirit, that's where they receive the power, and that's where they begin that ministry. And so that was a partial fulfillment of this verse in Joel 2.28, where it says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Okay? So this is what's going to happen, according to Joel. Uh, there's going to be, God's Holy Spirit is going to be poured out on all flesh. And so people say, oh, well, that was fulfilled at Pentecost. That's what happened. Well, it was partially fulfilled at Pentecost. But it says here that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And that term there, all flesh, is kol basar. That's what it is in Hebrew. And kol basar, every time that's used in scripture, it refers to all people and all animals too. Okay, so it says like uh, during the flood, the flood wiped out all flesh both human and animals. So kol basar, wiped out all flesh. And uh, so here it says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So that if it was all humans, it would have been kol adam. So adam is the name for human, like Adam. Adam was the first human. And so, but it doesn't say kol adam. It says kol basar, which is all flesh. So God will pour out his Holy Spirit on all flesh, which indicates that it's not just going to be people, it's going to be animals that will receive the Holy Spirit. So it's a hard saying, and I think I'm not trying to necessarily convince somebody that animals can receive the Holy Spirit, 
I'm trying to convince people to choose to show love to animals and not, you know, slit their throats to eat their dead bodies, not to, you know, torture them and abuse them and things of that nature. Uh, and so that's a much smaller ask. But if you really read into the scripture, as I just did, uh, it's carefully worded there in Joel 2.28, where it's not just humans, but also animals have this capacity to receive the Holy Spirit. And then if you look at Revelation 5.13, it says, all animals on earth are praising God. So that sounds similar to the evidence of the Holy Spirit, where they're speaking in tongues and praising God, magnifying and glorifying him. So that might be the fulfillment uh, in the end times of all the animals receiving the Holy Spirit as well. So excellent question, question, and we will get into that more in future live talks. All right, Tim, thanks for joining us. Uh, a Gentile is a non-Jew person. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so basically there's the Jews and the Gentiles. And as you said, if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. Uh, sometimes that word is uh, translated as the nations. So all the nations other than the nation of Israel. And so, yeah, it's basically just saying everyone other than Jews. So salvation is open to the Gentiles, not just the Jews, means it's not just open to Jewish people, it's open to everyone. So thank you for clarifying that. You're exactly right. Kelsey, personhood doesn't have to be human, so it's just something I'm wondering. Yeah, and in fact, Matthew King wrote a book called uh, And I Will Abolish the Bow, which is a reference to uh, Habakkuk 2.17, I believe where it says, and in that day I will abolish the bow, uh, sword and battle, I will banish from the earth, and all will lie down in safety. And so uh, there he talks a lot about uh, personhood, animal personhood, and what that means. And I think that regardless of how you want to phrase it, uh, the kind of simplest way that I, I look at it is animals are someone, not something. So animals aren't just these objects but they're someone, they're an individual. And so just like you treat another person, another human, as a someone with moral consideration, where you can show love and kindness to that individual, someone who's beloved by God. And uh, animals are the same way, where they are someones. And so there's plenty of scripture verses to suggest that animals are someones, not something. If you want to learn more about that topic, Suggest you read his book. He talks about it at length. So, good question. And now, Tim again. Well, they say all dogs go to heaven. Well, some say all dogs go to heaven, but Jesus says, do not give what is holy to the dogs. So, I'm just kidding. Well, he does say that, but that's obviously not what he meant. He says, preach the gospel to every creature. So, that would include dogs, right? All right, Blake, thank you for joining us. God bless you all. God bless you too, Jake. Uh, Blake, I hope that this was uh, an enjoyable and enlightening talk. Okay, I'll see you again. Are animals included in the Gentiles? Because the scripture says salvation is open to everyone. Uh, that's Tim, that's why I ask. It is said that salvation is now open to Gentiles, which is everyone. Non-human animals are non-Jews. Yeah, so again, that's an interesting line of thought and I think that there's a similar line of thought at Genesis 9, uh, 8 and 9. So after the flood, he says, well, now you're following your own evil imagination and you're going to see the animals as food and they're going to be afraid of you. And so people are like, oh, well, animals were just added to the menu now in Genesis 9, verse 3. But if you keep reading in Genesis 9, five times, God says, I make my covenant, not just with the people, the humans, but also with all the animals, that I will never again destroy the earth with a flood. And so why is God reiterating time and time and time and time and time again in this chapter that animals are fellow recipients of the covenant promise if they're just many items now? So it's a similar, similar idea that like God cares about the animals. That's why he makes covenant promises with them and why he made it so clear that no, they're not menu items. They're, in, they're individuals. They're someone I care about, care about so much that I include them in this covenant promise. 
signified by the rainbow. And so I think it's a similar thing here that it's like, well, you shouldn't call these animals unclean. Well, that doesn't mean that now you start eating them. It means, well, start treating them as individuals and showing them love. That would be the fullest expression of understanding that, uh, what that's about. But again, I'm not trying to, uh, we're not trying to convince someone like the fullness of it. If you're convinced of that, wonderful. If it helps you, wonderful. But we're just trying to get step one. Step one is stop treating animals as commodities to serve the desires of your flesh. Start treating them with love and dignity, uh, the way God designed us from the beginning. Start living according to that kingdom way of treating animals peacefully and not violently. All right, Lily, a very interesting point about God testing and his style of teaching. It rings true to me that God would use a challenging vision like that rather than telling him in a different way. Thanks, Craig. I feel more equipped now to respond to those who bring up this passage. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Lily. And there's going to be more, uh, more in the talks about testing. So we're going to do kind of a deep dive into what that means. And there's uh, there's actually over a dozen, probably multiple dozen times where, in fact, yeah, almost a hundred times where God tests people throughout scripture and even uses the word test to describe what he's doing. And so we're going to examine what those tests are about, what we could learn from them and things of that nature. Uh, but yeah, it is uh, definitely worth considering that sometimes God gives these instructions not because he's changing his mind or because he's this like genocidal, murdering, child sacrificing, like animal killing God. It's because he's testing us to reveal what's in our own heart. He already told us from the beginning what is very good and what he wants us to do, what we were designed to do. Just look at the first, chap first two chapters of Genesis. He never changed his mind from that. But we changed and our hearts are, are bent on evil and bent on doing things contrary to God's will. So instead of him just saying, hey, don't do what is, do is bad, instead do what is good, we're just like, well, yeah, you've been telling us from the beginning and we're ignoring you. So instead he uses these like challenging visions that we have to ponder over and puzzle over and then it makes sense to us and things like that. So God is a very merciful God and he doesn't just say, well, you're ignoring me, you're doing evil, I'm going to wipe you out. He is patient with us and gives us many opportunities and works with us, meets us where we're at. And so this is just another instance of him doing that. Uh, Philip, thank you again for joining us. You always have good questions. Sorry if you have already mentioned this. I missed part of the talk. Leviticus 20, 24 through 26 is clear that the reason why God gave his people a distinction between, an unclean food, between clean and unclean foods uh, was to separate them from other people's to be his. Therefore, it makes sense that in Peter's dream, God reverses the symbolism of Leviticus when he sends him to meet with the Gentiles. Okay, let's look at that. Leviticus 20, 24 to 26. So Leviticus 20, starting with verse 24. But I have said to you, you shall inherit their land, and I will give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. Which, if you don't know what that means, uh, we gave a talk about the land flowing with milk and honey a couple weeks ago. So check that out. I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the peoples. You shall therefore distinguish between clean beasts and unclean, between unclean birds and clean. And you shall not make yourselves abominable or unclean, by beast or by bird or by any kind of living thing that creeps on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean. And you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. Uh, yes, good point. Uh, that was that was part of what he was doing there was he was separating the people from all the surrounding peoples. And if you look at Romans 12, 1 and 2, it elaborates even further on this idea. It says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. 
and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So here, if we look all the way back to the beginning, what was God's perfect and acceptable and very good will? It was, he says, what I want you to do is eat the fruit of the tree and the green plants of the ground that shall be your food, have dominion over the whole earth and over all the animals, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, be these caretakers of the garden, these keepers of the animals, the keepers of the garden, and uh, these preservers, protectors. And so that was his good and acceptable and perfect will, even before sin entered the world. And so that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to separate ourselves from the pagan, violent ways of the world, to the adulterous ways of the world, to the ways of the world that are uh, eating other creatures, uh, being violent toward them to serve the desires of our flesh. Like those things we're not supposed to do. God said, that's not my good and perfect and acceptable will. Like that's not what I want you to do. Be separate from those things, among many other things. It's not just about uh, animals, but that's part of it. So good point. And now, Tim, uh, there's verses that could be interpreted to support the notion of animals having souls. Uh, Genesis 1.30 would be the first one where it explicitly says uh, animals have a nefesh, nefesh, which is soul. So animals definitely have a soul. It's the same word used to describe human souls as well. Uh, clearly, it's not possible for them to actively practice religion or to ask Jesus for salvation, but they do praise Jesus in Revelation 5.13. In my mind, they must be held to a different standard. Yeah, and I think the, the, an important distinction between humans and animals is the level of responsibility that God gives humans compared to animals, where he says in Genesis 126, he creates humans in his image and gives us dominion. So we're the ones with the responsibility of preserving the world according to God's will. The animals don't have that respons same responsibility. They're just told to be fruitful and multiply. And so... Uh, it's it's not that they're maybe not capable, it's that God didn't ordain them with the responsibility that he ordained us with. And so we shouldn't be misusing that responsibility to do whatever we want, which is what we see rampant in the world today, uh, but instead we should be using that authority to fulfill the responsibilities God gave us according to the ways God designed All right, uh, good question. And now Lily, again, very interesting point about God testing. Uh, we already read that. So Kathy, who is going to Discord for fellowship? Yes, yeah, so uh, I guess now would be a time to mention that. Uh, after this talk, which we're coming to a close, we're going to meet up in Discord. So if you haven't downloaded Discord, there's a link on the sidebar of our website, creationcarechurch.org. And there you can go and click on it and download it, and it automatically brings you a link to join Creation Care Church server. And then there's uh, a list of groups, and you'll see other people in the group. It's a, a voice chat where you can join. Uh, it's like a common area, or common room, something like that. So definitely come join us after the live talk in about 10 minutes. We're going to be meeting up in Discord for fellowship. So, Tim, again, meeting to talk about the live talk or anything else we want to talk about. Yep. So, Tanya, thanks for another Friday of great informative explanations. Thanks for joining us, Tanya. Yeah, let's do one more. In Genesis, Pharaoh had a dream in which seven ugly thin cows devoured seven fat cows. Does this mean that God wants cows to become carnivorous? Thankfully, Joseph was able to interpret Pharaoh's dream. Sometimes God uses abstract imagery and visions. Uh, yeah. So again, that's another good example of the, the visions not being intended to be understood as a straightforward thing, but as indicating uh, something that we need to grapple with or puzzle over, meditate on, uh, to really wrestle with, to try to understand uh, what is the purpose of this vision? And it's not that God is just changing his mind, contradicting himself. It's that he's 
uh, giving us this this thing to ponder over. It says, meditate on my on my law, on my word, day and night. That's what he wants us to do, is to really meditate on his instructions, which conveniently come in these books of the Bible. It tells us a whole bunch about God. So thank you for your questions. If you can, if you have more questions, we haven't gotten to all of them. Uh, continue to ask them in the chat, and we'll get to them in text form. But I wanted to share with you next week's topic, and this is one that a questioner asked a couple weeks ago. So hopefully, uh, if you're with us, it's did Jesus cause a herd of pigs to drown? So let's look at Matthew chapter eight, verses thirty to thirty-two. And this is in three of the Gospels. It's in Matthew 8, Mark 5, and Luke 8. But in Matthew, it says, Now there was a herd of many, many pigs feeding at a distance from them. And the demons begged him, saying, If you are going to cast us out, send us into the herd of pigs. And he, Jesus, said to them, Go. And they came out and went into the pigs. And behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. So people sometimes say this, uh, this passage of Jesus, there, there was this uh, man, he was demon possessed. He had a whole bunch of demons in him. And Jesus came to cast out those demons. And the demons were like, Jesus, don't cast us into the abyss, but instead let us go into this herd of pigs. And Jesus was like, go. And they left the man they were possessing, went into the herd of pigs the herd of pigs became violent and rushed down the hill and all drowned, like 2,000 pigs. And the man was cured. The demons were, were out of him. And so people point to this story and they say, well, how can you tell me that God cares about animals? It, why did Jesus cause this herd of pigs to go down the hill and drown if, uh, if Jesus cares about animals and God wants us to care about animals? So that's the topic for next week. I don't want to spoil it for you. But if you want to look into it, again, it's Matthew 8, uh, Mark 5, and Luke 8. Those are the three Gospels in which this, uh, this story takes place. And that's going to be our topic we're going to dive into deeply next week. So I already announced that Discord, join us for fellowship. That we're going to immediately after the live call, jump on Discord and uh, join us for fellowship. And also, if you... Uh, haven't checked it out. If you'd like to contribute, we have a few goals that we're trying to meet, some things we want to do. And if you go to our website, there's a donate button on the top right corner, which gives you uh, easy instructions where you can make a one-time payment, a recurring payment, whatever you feel called and led that you'd like to do. Uh, but we're trying to increase our audience. We want to upload these live talks as a podcast for people to download that they could listen to on their way to work. And there's a service that does that and it's about $200 a year. So uh, we don't have to get that obviously all at once, but if you'd like to start contributing to help with, with that goal that we have, uh, we'd love to um, get your help with that. Of course, no obligation. The purpose of this ministry is to spread creation care message and the gospel message to all creation. Uh, but if you would also like to materially support, whether it's a dollar, whether it's $10, whether it's however much, uh, we greatly appreciate that and that's what we'll be using it for. So let's go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity where we can dive into your word and really understand uh, what this vision was that, that, you gave to, that you gave to Peter. And just thank you for being a God who, who gives us these opportunities to, to puzzle over your word and to puzzle over what your scripture means and just what your character is all about. And just thank you for being a God who was a God of love from the beginning and that you're uh, a God who's continuing to be a, a God of love to now and to eternity. You are the Alpha and the Omega, that you don't change. You've always been the same, your character of love. And thank you for having that love for all of your creatures, not just humans, but also to animals, and that you created this earth to be inhabited by humans and animals and to live in peace and joy nonviolence and love in your Holy Spirit, and that your kingdom will be restored on earth as it is in heaven, and your word will not return void, but will accomplish what it was intended to accomplish. Thank you for being patient with us, not willing that any should perish, but all to receive salvation and 
uh, unto eternal life. And so uh, we just pray that if there's anyone out here listening who hasn't been fully submerged in water and baptized and given their life to you as an adult who can make that decision on their own, just that they would choose to be like those 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 Gentiles and the house of Cornelius who they hear the word and they say, yes, we receive it, and they receive the Holy Spirit, and that evidence is, is there, and then they choose to get baptized in water so that they can uh, fulfill all the instructions that you gave us. And we just thank you for being a God who chooses all of us and doesn't want any to perish, but uh, you'll even go after us as the lost sheep. You'll leave the 99 to go after the one. Thank you for not giving up on us. Thank you for having that plan that doesn't exclude any of your creatures, but you show love and kindness to all of your creation. So we just pray that you give us that same heart and that same attitude so we can walk in your image and your light and spread that light in the world and that your message can reach as many people uh, as possible. So we thank you for everything that you do for us in our lives. We pray this all in your son Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again next week.